Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I hope everybody who wanted to stay dry is staying dry and that the afternoon and the festival is treating everybody fantastically. My name's Billy. It's an absolute pleasure to meet you all. What a, wow, what, what, a, what a professional and personal gratitude. What an honor to be here. This is my first festival in Jaipur. I promise you it will not be my last. I am just absolutely amazed at what I'm taking away from here. The... You're very kind. You're very kind. The, the kindness, the hospitality, the intellect, the, it's, it's almost too much to process. And I am just so thankful. Thank you that you all care enough to be here. Thank you for this incredible, incredible panel. Wow. I will be mercifully brief. Nobody is here to hear me. And I stand between you and these folks that you actually want to hear from. So I will take it. Uh, I will be very, very brief. Messrs. Filippelli, Sinha, Kant, Ms. Ramesh, the diver oh, sheer Kant, my apologies, Ms. Ramesh, the diversity of talent and knowledge you collectively bring to this forum is as eclectic as it is profound, and uh, we're all the better for it. We all know it. The concept, the idea to me of chasing real, the real sustainability often seems so mer mercurial, so elusive. It's so incredibly, perhaps unduly so, complex, and I cannot wait to hear your perspectives. I would say this. Of recent, we have witnessed a true groundswell of leadership, innovation, and ambition from individuals, communities, and indeed nations around the world, from renewable energy initiatives to conservation efforts and sustainable development projects. The momentum for change is tangible, and the moment's upon us. It's here. At the heart of this groundswell lies a shared commitment to championing solutions to one of the clarion calls of our time, the climate crisis. And I thank the powers that be that collaboration and innovation are alive and thriving. And I am thrilled that the United States and India are working together to innovate, to collaborate, cooperate, and better our condition, our planet's condition, indeed nature's condition in health. I would briefly mention electric public transportation here in India. In late 2023, our nations jointly committed to help bring 10,000 Indian-made electric buses to cities across this nation, bringing into reality a joint vision first announced during Prime Minister Modi's visit to the White House, state visit to the White House. Our elected leaders have emphasized their shared vision to deploy clean energy at scale and accelerate cooperation in green hydrogen, offshore and onshore wind, and other emergent technologies. And they have highlighted efforts to increase mineral security cooperation to ensure our nations, our peoples, have the means and resources needed to advance our shared clean energy goals. Our nations are strengthening early warning systems for climate hazard, including shared access to real-time data, leaning forward to take early action, strengthening our resilience and ability to respond to catastrophe, and better protect our peoples. But I think everybody here would agree that now is not the time to rest upon our laurels, for we all know how quickly they will, and there is so much, much more to be done. Thankfully, some of the greatest minds and talents and hearts of our time are dedicated to slowing, mitigating, and combating climate change and its staggering impacts. Thank you all again for caring enough to be here. Thank you all again for what you have done. Mr. Shirkant, the floor is yours. I wish everybody a fantastic festival, fantastic afternoon. Thank you. This is why I can never hear me. We're good? So what we have in front of us today is, well, it feels like a big question. How do we get to a more sustainable, equitable, climate resilient economy? It's a big question, but we've got some amazing people on stage to help us answer this. I want to start with uh, Mridula. And the reason I want to start with Mridula is we hear questions like this all the time and you get a bunch of really high level ideas about what we might do, but Mridula is actually working very close to the ground and helping support companies and opportunities around what she calls last mile climate solutions. I personally think they're incredibly important as an investor myself. So Mridula, can you tell us a little bit more about your work and some examples of um, efforts that you've supported recently in that last mile space? Sure. Um, thank you, JLF, for having me and um, you know, to be in this very august panel. I'm going to start with 
what we've all experienced last year, which was the hottest year on records. Okay. And I think 1.5 is a forlorn hope and 2 degrees is slipping away. So I think it's past time to adapt. So before I get into ground level principles, I'll just give you two high level concepts I use to make those interventions. One is, um, I think it's past time to adapt. The world is well seized of the carbon problem and there, unlike most people, I am quite hopeful we will get our emissions down as we are already doing in parts. But I think adaptation is sometimes the forgotten stepchild and we need to focus on that and that's um, the hill I, chosen to die on. Second, I look at climate action like a relay race. The first leg of the relay race is really about awareness and conscience. And to me, that part of the race has broadly been run. The second part of the race, which is what we are running now, is about scaling action, right? And as a parent, I don't know where William is, he's there. Um, I, I don't know how many of you have teenagers. Right? If you have kids, if you have teenagers, you know conscience doesn't work. And in this second leg of the relay race, it's not about conscience at all. It's not about even awareness. It's about economics and incentives. So that's the leg I want to focus on. So I, my, my tent or my part in the tent is really about adaptation and about creating scalable action. There, uh, let me give you two examples of uh, startups that I've invested in. Many of you may come from Punjab and you know that Punjab grows a lot of rice but Punjab gets only about between 400 to 700 millimeters of rain but rice takes 1200 millimeters of rain to grow so that's why Punjab's aquifers are just plummeting down same with Haryana but if you try telling a farmer save water they'll tell you to go climb a tree so this startup that I've invested in what they do is they work with thousands of Punjabi farmers but they don't tell them that they're saving water, which is what they actually do. They put sensors in the ground and they cut, you know, sometimes even 90% of water. But they work with an NGO to tell them, hey, you know what, you can really increase your yield. You can really reduce your fertilizer. And they've done it. They've worked with, you know, thousands of farmers to cut waste. And now let me give you an urban example. Many of you want to know, I want to manage my waste. I want to go zero waste. But we have no clue how to do it, right? So this wonderful startup that I've invested in called Sahas um, works with communities, works with companies, helps them, handholds them, and we all need handholding to segregate their waste. And the moment waste gets segregated, it becomes gold. So they actually give their wet waste, which is all the food and everything else, to another startup that I've invested in, which takes that wet waste, which is now segregated, pressurizes it, and makes it into bio CNG which re replaces LPG. But I'll tell you what the killer is. The invisible amongst us, they're not sitting here today, are the waste pickers. They have an average life expectancy of less than 50 years. Sahas employs them, gives them PF, ESI. Um, I spoke to a waste picker, uh, Pandya Ma. She put her kid through engineering college. And that to me is really what impact and an equitable, resilient society is about. Thank you so much for those stories. Gabriel, I'm going to come to you next. Partly because, you know, Mridula has given us a view of what it looks like on the ground to adapt, but you've worked on adaptation for years at a much higher level. And you're also sitting in the U.S. where we've seen this huge wall of money come through in the form of the Inflation Reduction Act, the Infrastructure Bill, and various other pieces of legislation at the national and state level. Could you walk us through your thinking on adaptation as it relates to your country, particularly as new dollars are flowing in? No, I, I'm happy to, and I'm happy to be here as well. Um, I want to put on first uh, a little bit of my geologist hat, and I'll get to that. So we've heard a lot that 2023 was the hottest year on record, and that's very true. But you also, it is also true that 2023 will be among the coldest years that we'll ever live through, right? So that provides the incentive for this kind of rapid action. Now, one thing that kind of goes miscounted in this is that we look at these things from very much a human time scale, right? Uh, but in fact, the level of carbon dioxide, that warming gas in our atmosphere right now is, we haven't seen that for millions of years. 
millions of years. And millions of years ago, the last time we saw it, the planet was very different. Sea level was about six to eight meters higher than it is today. Okay, so that's another cause for concern and uh, spurs to immediate action. But that's why it's wonderful to be on a panel like this, because I'm with people who actually do stuff, uh, people who promote policy that does stuff, and uh, we have all the technologies to solve these problems. And so hope has never been better. And the science will tell you that when we turn off the carbon switch, when we go to net zero, temperature will plateau. It will not get any warmer. Uh, the, the ice might still take a little while to recover, but we, we will not get warmer. So we have control of the volume knob. Okay. So how are we applying that in the U.S.? How are we trying to, to make all of this big talk that I've heard in these last four days, which have been phenomenal, um, how does it work when you actually talk to communities? And you work with communities as well. Communities don't care what COP is doing or what the UN is doing. Communities have flooded streets and baking downtowns, right? Um, they are facing the climate crisis already right now. And, and, and I'm just going to provide two examples how I see it, it, this playing out in a really positive way. The uh, Biden administration passed the Inflection, in, Inflation Reduction Act, which is really a climate change bill. $400 billion almost to confront the climate crisis in an equitable way um, and to do it quickly. So there's this fire hose of federal funding um, and, and yet there's communities who actually need that money to en enhance their infrastructure for stormwater, right? To reduce the temperature of their cities. So what our institute does is try to pair the communities with the money. So we make sure that that money gets in the right hands and we don't do that by telling the community what their answer is. We sit with the community. They inform our response to all of this. And, and in so doing, I think we found some tremendous success. We just, we're just a little university. We just got $5 million of federal funding to, uh, to make cities cooler and to do it in an equitable way. So I, I see tons of positivity with this, but I also see uh, a real urgency. Brilliant, thank you so much. Coming next, Amitabh Kant, who plays an incredibly important role in Indian policymaking. So my question really is, you know, you've seen the US pass the IRA, you've seen Europe do a similar thing with the Green Deal. Lots of countries are spending significant amounts of money, not just on climate action, but climate action that benefits their countries. So I'd love to hear about your view more strategically around India's response, um, particularly from a policy perspective. Uh, so um, first of all, let me say that uh, Inflation Reduction Act of USA and I'm repeating this again for everyone. That's very highly protectionist in nature. Uh, I'm saying this because the world needs green hydrogen. And the world needs green hydrogen because if all this electricity, if every bit of electricity in India goes renewable, uh, it goes renewable, that's 20% of our energy. You must understand this. The balance 80% of our energy comes from, is all steel, cement, refinery, uh, uh, long distance transport, fertilizer. All this is what we call the hard to abate sector where fossil fuel is used, coal or fossil fuel is used. Now green hydrogen is important because when Europe and America were urbanizing, uh, they used fossil fuel. They made cities for cars and not for people. And therefore, they've gone on to exploit fossil fuel. 1%, 1% of the private companies in the world, 1% of the private companies in the world account for 40%, 40% of the greenhouse emission in the world. None of them, we put a carbon tax on them. And so the challenge is that this 80% of the fossil fuel that is used in steel, cement, etc., we are able to make it, turn it into clean fuel. The clean fuel is green hydrogen. Green hydrogen is made by using renewable to crack water and through a process of electrolyzer and then you get green hydrogen which can then replace gas, which can replace all fossil fuel. Now, green hydrogen today in America is sold at $6.5 a kilogram. In India, because of weather condition, we produce it at $4.5 a kilogram, etc. 
the challenge is that the world must move must move from fossil fuel to green hydrogen that is the challenge that is the number one challenge before the world do renewable more and more renewable and make renewable into green hydrogen to replace put green hydrogen steel cement refinery all this long distance transport all this put green hydrogen now the ira act what it does is that it says that i will subsidize green hydrogen only in if it is produced in the united states of america only if it is produced in the united states of america you need a global response a global response to climate change you need a global response everybody to work together anybody and what the united states action has done is to bring green hydrogen production in australia india korea to a standstill and move production only to the united states of america and therefore the policy of united states of america should be global it should be at least quad led so that india australia becomes a part of that anybody producing green hydrogen in this part of the world should be able to bring it down to the challenge before the world is that we should be able to bring green hydrogen from 4.5 dollar to 1 dollar per kilogram by 2030 that is the challenge before the world and to bring it down to 1 point to 1 dollar per kilogram all of us the united states the europe australia india all of us have to have one policy it can't be a united states policy it can't be australia policy it can't be a india policy it has to be a global policy to transform the world and that is what is not happening can i ask you a follow up if you don't mind i think this is a really good point i mean lots of observers have said protectionism is i mean the growth of protectionism in parallel with the growth of climate action is a really worrying trend and this is not just the us lots of western countries have done exactly the same thing but india is not a stranger to protectionism right no, like no. we we put so 40% let me let me respond to that you no know, the question was just that we put 40% tariffs on solar panels in 2022 to encourage local manufacturing that likely will slow down the transition but it will encourage local manufacturing you're no stranger to that how do we kind of balance those two things so the challenge is before the world is that uh, you know if you look at the total carbon space available the total carbon space available at 1.5 degree 1.5 degree centigrade the total carbon space available is 2800 gigatons 2400 gigaton has already been occupied by the developed world there's nothing left for developing countries so if only 400 gigaton is left and if india has occupied only 1.5 degree centigrade on a per capita income basis india should be entitled to 17.5% so there's nothing left and you are still you are still opening up more and more fossil fuel you are opening up more and more oil fields you are the western part of the world is not living up to its commitment for cop 21 that is the challenge before the world so if the western part of the world lives up to its com it has neither lived up to its commitment for climate change which it had made at paris and neither lived up to its commitment for financing developing countries which had it had made in cop to cop in at copenhagen in 2009 it has neither provided finance nor has it provided technology to the developing countries and now it is not even providing a level playing field in policy i mean to sum that up and that's very fair what you're saying is historic injustice can't be layered on top of current injustice and western countries that can afford it should actually be helping global development i want to come to someone who's been working on this for the last i don't know how long well over a decade um and you've been the beneficiary of incentives here in india and elsewhere what would you like to see going forward in a place like india look i i think i think a lot is already happening in india so i i don't know that we can ask for anything more or expect anything more i think if you look across at the whole area you have um, uh you know a, a a very transparent mechanism to allocate capacities we have the 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 attempt to develop a domestic manufacturing industry that is going on as well and i'll answer the question about why we need to have it in a second uh we now are pushing forward very aggressively on rooftop solar manufacturing um so i think a lot of things are being done in india I, I, and i think that we are very much on track to get to 
500 gigawatts of renewable energy capacity by 2030 and essentially meet all of our COP28 and, and COP21 obligations as well. Um, I think the issue really is, to, to the answer the question also a little bit or to add to what Mr. Kant was saying and what you were asking earlier, see that today uh, everybody in the whole world depends on Chinese imports. China controls 90% of the, of the entire clean energy supply chain and that's just not a healthy situation for the world to be in, right? Uh, we, we, can't, we can't have climate change being or actions on climate change being held hostage to our relationship with one country. What happens if there's another pandemic and supply chain shut down? Or what happens if there is a geopolitical event and supply chain shut down? Does it mean that the rest of the world should stop installing solar panels? Obviously not, right? So even if there's a higher cost to pay in the beginning uh, to develop uh, industries outside of China, uh, solar panel manufacturing in India, batteries, wind turbines and so on, then I think it's well worth for us to pay that extra cost in the beginning and make sure that we actually develop those industries as well. And then eventually we use all of that, the scale and the, and the knowledge of the Indian market to become exporters to other parts of the world. So that is something we must absolutely be doing. But you know, when I look at the rest of the world and to take forward the points that Mr. Kant was making on, on global trade policy, the problem is that while on the one hand the world talks about wanting to deal with climate change very aggressively and very seriously, when you look at the actual action steps being taken uh, by countries on trade policy, they are very protectionist. And it is not actually channelizing capital into the areas which will most efficiently re reduce carbon emissions in the world. And I'll give you another example. If you look at the carbon market, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with the carbon markets, but globally, uh, the carbon price in Europe is about 100 euros per ton because it's a closed market. So all the, the investments that are, that are being made to reduce carbon, in, uh, carbon emissions to get that one credit costs 70 to 100 euros. Now that same, that same investment can perhaps offset 20 or 30 tons of carbon uh, emissions in other parts of the world. But today that capital is not flowing to places where it can actually have the most impact. Why? Because everybody has closed their markets and therefore carbon, the capital is not flowing in the most efficient way across the world. So in reality, therefore, we have set ourselves up through trade policies, through other mechanisms in a way that we are not really helping ourselves in the best possible way. And now with all of these uh, trade policies that are coming into place as well on, for example, carbon uh, on, on solar supply chains, for example, why don't we have French shoring agreements, for example, with the US or with Europe? Europe has made a big deal about diversifying its supply chains away from uh, China, but actually has not done anything about it specifically. They could be encouraging us to manufacture more solar panels in India, but there are no trade agreements in place of that nature. There are also no trade agreements for us to invest and generate carbon emissions reduction certificates in India and sell those in, in Europe. Those agreements and those negotiations are moving far too slowly for us to be able to deal with the consequences of climate change. And we all know we don't have more than seven to 10 years now to bend the curve uh, sharply downwards. And if you look at any forecast, it says that if this is where we are, the curve is going like this right now, but it has to actually come down like this. And we are just not prepared for that. And you know, when you go to events like COP20, all these COP events that happen, you sit in these conversations with all the energy ministers from all over the world, and everybody comes and gives their own party line. But unfortunately, there's just not enough happening behind that. The other thing that I've, again, to pick up Mr. Khan's point, the reality is that today companies are not involved in the whole discussion at all. Countries only are the ones that are having conversations. But corporates actually account for 65% of global carbon emissions. And there is no forum to discuss what companies are doing, what their curves are going to be like. There's no pressure on them. There's nobody validating the claims that they are making. So there's a huge amount of greenwashing that is beginning to happen as well. So I think corporates have to become a very important part of the global conversation around climate change and carbon emission reductions, which is really also not happening right now. So there are some very fundamental problems, I think, with the global architecture on discussions around carbon emissions reductions, which are fundamentally flawed and are not letting us go as fast as we need to, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, my observation just hearing you all speak is I think on some level, self-interest drives all of our behavior as individuals, as countries, 
and then kind of as a global commons. And I think all of you are arguing on some level for taking global interest into account. But if you look at the track records of you know, most stakeholders, self-interest has been the driving force for quite a lot of it. So that's the tension we have to grapple with, I think, as we move forward. But we only have 15 minutes left. I want to bring in a couple of questions. Maybe we'll then turn to discussion again. But um, there's a mic going around. Um, there's, there's a question at the back, at the very back, um, on the left. Maybe you start there. I think it's the last row. Have they got a mic, or should we pick someone else? Someone tell me, where are the mics? There, there's one there. Okay, let's do the yellow, the, the shirt. Go on the yellow shirt. Yeah. Right. So my question to the panel is, like, there are many, many think tanks around the globe uh, with their own metrics. Uh, they are publishing the report. So the simple question, like, uh, how we can trust uh, those metrics, those reports, and uh, how we uh, like uh, analyze or scrutinize the data to study the policy and the decision that uh, you guys are making? As someone who runs a policy organization, um, maybe you want to answer that. Uh, let's get a few more questions. Yeah, yeah. But maybe get, yeah, we'll ask do two more questions and then we'll, we'll field them. Someone here. Let's go front row here. Right here. Emeritus Professor at Cambridge University, Parth Das Gupta, review outlines three properties that mean natural processes which differ from produced capital goods mm -hmm. and accounting for them in economical terms. These features also make it impossible to raise many of the harms inflicted on the natural world back to those who are responsible. I totally agree with the point which Mr. Kant quoted to impose carbon tax on private firms. Are we waiting for the day when we will be suffering with a worldwide catastrophe to impose these kinds of economical policies which also account, uh, also account the prices and the costs of the natural resources which we are, un, uh, which we are ignoring all this time? Super, one Thank more. You. And should we do a question? Yeah, over there. The three, four questions. We'll do that on the side next. Some people at the back. Hello. Anybody can answer my question, maybe Mr. Sinha or Amitabh Khan ji, that uh, recently in Ayodhya perhaps, uh, PM Naren Modi announced that uh, thousands of solar panels will be installed. So my question is, where are those uh, solar panels are coming from? Who are manufacturing them? Hey, brilliant. Thank you. We have three questions. I think there's two groups of questions. One is on policy and think tanks. Maybe you can answer that one. So uh, on the data side, I think which is uh, very critical and very important that you must have good data. There are several uh, institutions which publish outcome-based data, but uh, UNFCC, that is, uh, which organizes the COP, etc. The United Nations data is what everybody goes by, and I think we should stick to that UNFCC data, uh, which really demonstrates that uh, that that has done all the scientific study which really demonstrates that uh, if you are not able to reach 1.5 degrees centigrade by 2050 the earth may survive but we all as human beings we'll all be extinct and therefore there is a need for coordinated global action Gabriel, if you want to talk about pricing carbon no i'll i'll go for that excellent question um see if you look at the natural services that forests and you know coral reefs and all other natural ecosystems provide if they were appropriately priced they would far eclipse um, you know any of our economic gdp but they're not priced but the more important thing is they don't generate cash flow for surrounding communities so let me talk about one and it's a great story so I was in Madhya Pradesh, and Madhya Pradesh, uh, one of the big forest commodities that comes out of that is a flower called mahua. Okay, and when I was when I went to a tiger sanctuary, I said, "Look, I heard that they make an excellent liquor from mahua. Can we try it?" They said, "No, madam, it's 
dirty, there's, they put bathroom chapels in it, etc. So then I went and researched this and um, it turns out that Mahua makes a delicious liquor. It's a floral liquor. But uh, collecting and selling Mahua, you know, I think my research told gives uh, forest uh, tribal family about 5,000 rupees a year. May not seem a lot to a lot of you, but that's the single biggest source of cash for them. And that, they light these little crescent flyers around the Mahua trees in the driest months of the year to collect, and that sets off forest fires. There's also animal man conflict in this. So we need to do this better, right? We need to collect the Mahua flowers better. We need to also give returns to communities better. So I said, look, Mahua can become India's tequila, but we need the policies to make it happen. And if we can do that sustainably, the cash flow from the forest would be better accounted because a lot of Mahua is lost, rots, etc. The great story is there's a delicious Mahua liquor called Mond that's being made in Madhya Pradesh. And it's made by women, uh, lady, you know, women's help groups. Only tribal women are allowed to make it. It's delicious. Please go try it. You will support tribal families and hopefully help keep forests safe, unlocking cash flow. That is a great story. I, I think on the question on the carbon pricing, I think we do need to have a global carbon price. Anybody who uses this precious carbon budget that is left should be asked to pay for it. But the problem is I don't think it's going to happen because it's too contentious politically at a global level. So unfortunately, I don't think it's going to happen. You may have certain markets in which you have uh, carbon pricing, but otherwise I don't think it's, there's going to be a global carbon price. And on the question of the rooftop uh, uh, program, I think all the solar panels are going to be made in India. I think we now have developed a domestic industry which is going to be at least 40 to 50 gigawatts in size. And I think all of those solar panels will be uh, used. I don't think we'll be importing anything any longer after this, at least as far as solar panels is concerned. We might import maybe the wafers, which are a little bit earlier stage. But certainly the solar cells and solar panels will all be made in India. And I think that's terrific. Brilliant. Should we get some questions from the back and on that side? So maybe that one? Uh, this question is to Amitab sir. In the recently uh, COP29, uh, there was an agreement on profit and loss fund because we have often talked about uh, developing countries paying the price of excesses of climate change by the developed countries. So uh, how does that accountability of that profit and loss fund, whatever it is called, and uh, who monitors that? Okay. Um, so first of all, uh, madam, I would really like to tell you that COP Cops are really talk shops. And, uh, you know, this loss and damage fund was spoken of at the last COP. It has not fructified. There is very little funding available for that. It's not really taken off. And uh, to my mind, uh, I am a strong believer that, uh, uh, you know, that as I had indicated that the developed world has not lived up to its commitment on financing, but India must, India must take the lead and must become the first country in the world to industrialize and manufacture uh, through a decarbonization process. We must take the lead and that we've demonstrated our great uh, political and administrative will by uh, doing 185 gigawatt of renewable nine years ahead of uh, our NDC targets. We put in the green uh, hydrogen mission. We've now rolled out the Surya the scheme by which we will provide uh, solar rooftop on house, houses and uh, push for production of uh, solar panels uh, within India. So we must take the lead because we are a new, <coughs> we are going to become the third largest country in the world in, by 27-28. We, our energy requirement will be huge and we must take the lead in many of these things and not worry too much about cop talking and not delivering. Super. Should we do one more? Maybe two questions <coughs> together, then we finish up. Um, is, so the person standing up in the red or the left. Can you pass the mic along, please. Uh, good evening. Can we incentivize the farmers all over the world to follow sustainable practices? That will be a huge uh, way forward. 
because they they are ignorant and they you need to uh, incentivize them to be part of this revolution actually why don't we take that first because it's it's a big question and to, just to add to that i mean agriculture forestry and other land use that big bucket is the elephant in the room for most countries right yeah. no carbon pricing scheme except for new zealand covers the agriculture sector and way way off track way more off track there than even in the energy system so i'm going to really push back on that farmers are not ignorant but they're dependent on what they're able to sell what the market off takes mm -hmm. right it's a quite desperate life and you know uh, providing credit and providing market solutions to farmers is an enormous opportunity again let me talk about one more startup that i work at and uh, uh, i'm not like this evil capitalist in the room i find very often that uh, uh, for profit and not for profit working in conjunction with government help often is the best thing so let me give you one uh, example of a startup in bihar okay like usually most of our rice rots away right uh, but what this guy does is he says i will lease out these government warehouses i will make sure they are maintained well and i will provide good storage that brings out your loss from 25% to 2% which means there's bigger there's more um, you know the farmer makes a greater income and i will only get paid if i bring down that loss so he's incentivized to do it because if he doesn't save the grain he doesn't um, make any money but the killer in the room and for the farmer cash is king okay and we'll go into farmer working capital cycles later but ca cash is king he takes farmers small farmers don't have access to formal banking it's very broken system he takes that grain he works with public sector banks and he gives them proof saying this is the grain and the farmer is able to get low cost interest loans against it so he's growing by leaps and bounds so please farmers not ignorant it's a really crap life at if you're a small and medium farmer <laughs> yeah. thanks gabriel do you want to tell us about the american farmer experience and how we change incentives there well i can reflect on that cuz i totally agree um mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the policies, a lot of the agricultural policies around the world, but I can speak most definitively about that in the U.S. because I know most about it, are designed uh, to be not climate resilient and not smart when it comes to how we produce crops. So if you'd ask a normal American, I'm from the middle of the U.S., so there's fields all around us whenever you go on a trip. When you ask a normal American, they'd say, oh, we're growing food, soybeans and corn. Well, yeah, that's, that's, in a sense, that's partly true, but it's mostly food for other animals that we then eat, um, or it's, um, it's feedstock for oil production, which is a stupid way to make ethanol uh, out, of, out of grain. And so we have this, and, and guess what? When climate change wreaks havoc on crops, like extreme drying, flooding, uh, the U.S. government, through our farm bill, provides crop insurance to them. So they always have this backstop, this low-level backstop that is not climate resilient. So I would just urge uh, anybody who has, who has some, some action or some agency uh, to influence uh, agricultural policies to make sure they're climate resilient. Because, again, only speaking for the U.S., ours is not. We have time for one question, a really quick question, maybe in the pink, in the middle. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, so I just want to ask a question around degrowth. So everyone is so focused around growth, growth, and growth. But what Japan did was their GDP fell, but their lifestyle is pretty amazing. They have a Got slow it. lifestyle, etc. Just the panel's thought. So why that. don't we just do rapid fire each of you views on degrowth, and then we wrap up. Um, and maybe, where are you going? Uh, Sir, uh, it's after you. After you. After you. Look, I think that's a privileged statement. If I go to someone in Dharavi and say there's degrowth, you're not going to get a job. I'll be beaten and I should. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> Gabriel? And I think we have our, our balance wrong, and I think it's up to us to, to recalibrate. Uh, degrowth is, I, I don't want to wade into that, but I will say that um, we certainly do not um, act sustainably. The, the topic of this panel is sustainability, right? We do not act sustainably in our individual lives and in our corporate lives and in our national lives. So sustainability is part of, of coming to that Japan example, is they downscaled in a sustainable fashion. No, I entirely agree. It's not about degrowth. It's about sustainable growth. And uh, Prime Minister has talked at length about uh, lifestyle for environment because, uh, you know, how do we, each one of us, becomes a pro-planet people by even uh, switching off your lights or by ensuring that water taps are put off. 
But to the point somebody asked, uh, which is very important, is that as I said, uh, that there is no provision right now where companies, private sector, change will not come from COPs. We've had COP, 20, 28 COPs, no change will come from COP. Change will come the minute you start putting penalties on companies and the penalties will come uh, if 1% of the companies produce 40% of greenhouse emission in the world, if stock markets start penalizing. And that will happen the minute you put out data that these are companies which are doing greenhouse gas emissions. Consumers will then stop buying their stocks and the stock markets will plummet. The markets should be directly correlated to the amount of greenhouse gas emission that you produce. And a moment for someone. Final yeah, thoughts? Look, I, I think degrowth is not natural. It may happen involuntarily, which is fine. But uh, I think every country, every human being wants to improve their quality of life. The question, as we've discussed, is how to do it sustainably. I also don't feel that at this point, uh, capital markets really care about climate change, unfortunately. Uh, we do a number of green bond issuances, uh, but we don't get any reduction in interest costs from the market. So unfortunately, markets do not care about climate change, uh, except as a business opportunity. But certainly, nobody's going to accept any less lessening of returns on investments. If it, if it does not make sense. Brilliant. I think that's it. We're being kicked off stage. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for your questions. Um, let's give this audience a round of applause. Thank you.